Well, welcome to our 19th, our next to the last study of the book of Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 26 and 27 today, looking at some things, and then we're going to wind out next week, and that will end our Matthew series. I have enjoyed this study very much. I'll talk more about that next week, and I'll tell you where we're headed with our new study. Uh, but we have been looking at Jesus as king. And today I want to look at King's trial. Now you may think you know where this lesson is going, but I want to look at a specific trial. So remember, there are several places you can find this lesson series. You can find it on YouTube at oldunionchurchofchrist.com uh, under the Lesson and Sermons tab. And our website, uh, it's right there, and you can find that. You can also go to YouTube and just type in Old Union Church of Christ and... Um, you'll find that you can see a, a variety of lessons there. Our minister here puts on sermons. We have worship videos for Sunday mornings uh, and then some other studies that we're doing. But uh, all the Matthew lessons are there, including some worksheets. So, remember last week we talked about the King's Supper. We talked a little bit about Passover. We talked about some of the history of Passover. We talked about some of the elements of Passover, some things that when you read it, you probably don't get because you're not usually coming from a Jewish background or understand the ceremony. Uh, we saw that Jesus switched the script up, script up a little bit, right? Uh, and he moved from Passover to even some wedding ceremony language there. We talked about how it was a teaching lesson and um, a tasting lesson. And went through several things there. If you didn't watch that video, I hope you'll go back and do that. Today, I want us to look at King's trial. So the Lord's Supper, the, the King's Supper has been instituted. And they have taken of the bread. They have taken of the fruit of the vine, of the cup, right? And it says then what? They sung a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. Well, he also has a conversation with Peter. When we think of denial... We often think of Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus, and we're going to see some of that in today's lesson. But Peter also betrays Jesus. But before he does that, he says he will never do that. Any of you ever said, well, I'll never. And maybe you, before you had kids, you said, well, I'll never say that to my kids, or I'll never do what my parents did. And sure enough, you found yourself in that place, right? Well, here is what Peter is talking about. Look with me. Then Jesus said to them, all of you, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written. Now, now remember that. All of you will stumble. Not, not just Judas. Some other things are happening here. I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. How many of us ever made that mistake? So well, I'll never do that. And sure enough, that's what we find ourselves doing. I think sometimes we even let Satan in, right? We say, well, that, that's never going to be a temptation for me. And Satan says, ah, you're not looking for it there. I'll slowly get you there. So, so be careful saying I'll never, right? He says, I'll never do this. And Jesus said to him, surely I say to you that this night, this night, right? The same night that, that we're dipping. I think, again, when we dip in that bowl, we think Judas, but, but they've all dipped in that bowl, right? Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And this is a pretty famous story here in the Bible. Um, I wish I had more time to, to talk about that. I've got some sermons on that. Uh, if you're not familiar with that story, I hope you'll look into it. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Right? I mean, Peter's always that guy right there out front. And so said all the disciples. Well, keep that in the back of your mind. Keep that in the back of your mind for today's lesson. When we hear trial, Jesus' trial, we probably think of this, right? I mean, a literal trial. Many of us have watched things like Law and Order, or maybe you grew up in a different time when there was a, another show on about courtroom drama, right? Well, this is not the trial I want us to look at. We're going to talk about it a little bit near the end, but Jesus is going to have a personal trial, not one where there's judge and jury, but one where he has to work through something very hard. So, Let's get started. It's here. It's found in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus is going to have the trial or the agony of the cup. Now he's just instituted the cup. Well, what did the cup, what, what did that cup, the third cup, symbol? the blood of the lamb, his blood. 
All the things he's working for are here. And, and now he has to face that. So, they have met and they have shared the cup with each other. It is the new covenant. Remember, he, he talked about that, that he wouldn't drink it again with them until he came again. You can find the story of the Passover feast, of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, Jesus talking about betrayers, the Lord's Supper, um, and things that go on in the upper room and other places in the Bible. I just wanted you to see. If you're new to Bible study and you're thinking, I'm going to start reading my Bible, and this guy started lessons in Matthew, I can't wait to read Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to read some of the same stories. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels. They're the good news. They're the story of Jesus. Some of the stories are, are rep repetitive, right? That you're going to find them in all of them. So if you're reading Matthew, Jesus. If you're reading Mark, Jesus. If you're reading Luke, Jesus. If you're reading John, Jesus. When you get to Acts, you start the Acts of the Apostles, the beginning of the church, and, and then letters uh, to the church and other things there. So if you're new to Bible study, I kind of want to point that out. Just wanted you to see that some of the things that we're talking about are in other parts of the Bible. Now, what is this agony of the cup? What is this trial that Jesus, well, it is one of the most probably moving experiences recorded. Uh, the, the way that Jesus' body handles it physically, the way that he handles it spiritually, you can hear it in his words. And we're going to see that there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're going to see his humanity. Yes, he is son of God. But remember, what has he called himself in Matthew a lot? Son of man. He knows what it's like to be human, and he is going to die. That's not something his body has ever done before. He is going to be have nails driven in his body. He's going to be whipped and skirted. These are new experiences for him. So, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. Gethsemane means oil press. It means oil press, right? It's beyond the brook of Kidron, and um, it's probably three quarters of the mile outside of the city. Uh, it, it's on a hill. Now, one of the things that I want to show you here was a map of Jerusalem. And I want you to see, here is the temple. Okay, we, we've had several stories of Jesus in the temple. Um, notice way over here is where we think the upper room is. And out here are the Mount of Olives. Now, to make this a little bit easier... Uh, let's just kind of follow Jesus here as they sang the song. They're, they're headed out of the city, right? Now, he crosses over the Kidron Valley on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And that probably means nothing to you and I, uh, unless you're, you're into geography and you understand what's happening here. The Kidron Valley, there's, there's a small brook that runs through the Kidron Valley. It is Passover. They have been killing lambs to eat and to sacrifice all day long in Jerusalem. It said that that little brook ran with the blood of lambs. So notice it's, it's right there on the edge of the temple. The, the sewer system of the temple dumps into the Kidron Brook, right? They have been sacrificed and they have come to Jerusalem to do the Passover. They're sacrificed lamb and blood of the lamb has been flowing in that brook all day. And now, crossing over that brook, is the Lamb of God. And as he looks down into that valley and he sees that river of blood, he realized that's him. That that's going to be him. He is going to bleed for humanity. And I want to make sure that you don't miss that. I think sometimes we, we read a little phrase in the Bible and we don't think about where it is or what it looks like or why that's in there. But as Jesus crosses that valley, there is the blast of the blood of the Lamb of the Passover flowing out of the city. And here is the new Passover Lamb walking over that as he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane. So, there's the Mount of Olives. There's where the Garden of Gethsemane, or Gethsemane, right, Olive Press. It's high. You can see the city of Jerusalem. People were still celebrating the Passover. Lights were still on. The lights in the temple would have been on as he goes out to this garden to pray. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, Sit here where I, while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful. Uh, I've highlighted that. We're going to look at that, right? When we say sorrowful, we mean distress. We, we mean he is sad. He is grieved. 
Remember, he's just walked over the blood of the lamb, and he is about to become the blood of the lamb. And they have just had a ceremony where they have celebrated the blood of the lamb. Right? If you're interested in the Greek word, it's here. It's a state of sadness to call someone to be sad or sorrowful or distressed, to make sad, right? He began to be sorrowful. I don't know how you picture Jesus' countenance, how, how he, he would have looked if you'd seen him walking down the street. But on this night, we're going to see the emotion of sadness of sorrow, of grief, something you may have experienced, and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. He tells the guys, I'm down. Maybe you've been down in this pandemic, right? Maybe you spent a lot of time isolated. Stay here and watch with me. Now, deeply distressed. Well, what does that mean? Well, again, if you're into the Greek, uh, that's what the Bible is written in, it means to be distressed and troubled with a probable implication of anguish, right? To be troubled, to be upset, um, to be full of heaviness. You ever have days where you are just you just feel heavier? And I don't mean because you've eaten a big meal. They've just eaten a big meal, right, the Passover. I mean, you just feel like the weight of the world is on you. Well, that's kind of where Jesus is in the story. And I want you to hear that. Because I think sometimes we think of God and Jesus is, is out there somewhere and they never experienced what we've experienced. Jesus is experiencing what you experience. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Well, the idea here is what? Being so sad and so sorrowful that, that I want to die or that I can almost die or, or I can't. And he is about to, remember. He is about to. It's, it's an intense sadness, Right? I'm not sure that's the Jesus we often see. As we think about this, he had asked his disciples to stay and watch. You probably have a good friend. You have somebody who's gotten you through lots of things, and maybe you have a, a thing like, if it were not for, and you can put someone's name in there, I don't know what I would have done. And maybe it's a different time and different places in your life. Uh, maybe it's somebody who helped you work on a situation on your house or in your personal life or on the job or got you a job, right? I mean, you have some names that, wow. These, so he has called the closest to him and said, hey, watch with me, wait with me. But I want you to see that instead of being there to encourage, actually, they're not with him at all. You ever been in a conversation with someone and not really be in the conversation? Maybe, maybe you were on the phone with somebody and it got quiet and you realized it was your turn to talk and you really hadn't been paying attention. Well, that's a little bit what happens here. Keep reading with him, if you will. Jesus goes off to pray. Are you ready? Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup, this is the trial, right? The cup. Let this cup, what cup? the one they had just drank, the cup of redemption. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Again, a second time he went away and prayed. You said in verse 42, I've split that there, but we're going to come back. And he went away and he prayed and said, Oh, my father, if this cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. First he says, God, is there another way this can happen? Is there another way? And then he comes back and he says, What? Your will be done. Your will be done. I think sometimes we pray what we want and we want to be like what? How we thought about it in our mind. We just kind of want to have God a set of plans and him stamp them and say, Okay, that's how it's going to be. Instead of really saying, you know, we in our prayer sometimes, your will be done. But then we don't want to do it because it's hard sometimes. So Jesus doesn't say, God, change your will. Notice he doesn't say, God, you know what? Uh, we should come up with a new plan. This dying on the cross thing, I mean, I'm just not into it. Now, he, he's questioning. He's wondering a little bit. I think as Christians sometimes we, we do wonder when we go through hard times what that's about, right? But his willingness is to obey his Father. And it's his love for us. He can't quit because of us, because he is the Lamb without blemish, right? Go back to the in-between, right? So he prays. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Now, let's cut them some slack. They had just had a meal. It's been a long day. It's late at night. I mean, many of you have eaten a large Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner and then found yourself in the den watching a ball game and falling asleep, right? And he said to Peter, now, it's interesting they bring out what Peter, oh, I, I'm going to die. I, I'll never betray you, right? I'll never stumble. What? 
Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What? Well, Peter, you want to, but are you? Will you? Again, a second time he went away and prayed and saying, what does he pray the second time? Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Unless I become this cup, that's how it's going to have to be. Again, his human body was going to feel pain like he had never felt before. And he came and he found them sleeping again for their eyes were heavy. So he has the best with him, right? People, And they said, oh, you know, we'll be there. And they can't even stay awake. It's a moment where he needs them, but notice he is praying to the Father. And if Jesus prays in a hard time, don't you think we should? I mean, is that not a lesson? So he left them and went again and prayed the third time, saying the same words, right? Man, he is talking to God at a deep prayer. Maybe you have, have groaned to God. Maybe he didn't even have words, right? It, it was just an ache. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man, there's that phrase again, is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus has made peace with the will of the fog. doesn't mean it's going to get any easier. It doesn't mean it's going to be less painful. But he's at peace with the will. I wonder if we're at peace with the will, right? We, we want it easy. We, we want not to hurt as much. We, we want to be able to do things. I, I teach school, and I, want st I have students who, who were in middle school, and, and they were okay students. And some of them even told me, well, I, you know, middle school, it's just kind of the in-between, right? It's high school that really matters. I'll turn it on in high school. Well, some of them did, but most of them didn't. They kept their same habits. But I had students who really went home and read the book. I have several students to this day, when I think of their name, I think of walking in and seeing them early in the morning or at lunch, reading the textbook, taking notes, trying to be a better student. And kids wonder, how did they get an A? Because they were willing to take the pain for the game, right? And I had other kids who they never opened the book, they, they, they didn't do what was necessary, and they always were, they were always a B, right? They never wanted to do the work to be an A. They didn't know how until the very end, of course, right? At the very end, they all of a sudden wanted to become an A student. But they hadn't done the work to be able to get the glory. So the victory. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve. So Judas isn't there, remember, told us who was there. With a great multitude with swords and clubs came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Remember, Judas has betrayed him. He's taken the money. He said, I'll find a time, and now Judas knows he's gone up to the hillside, right? Everybody else is down in Jerusalem eating and, and enjoying themselves. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whoever, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. That, that means teacher. He says, Hello, teacher, and kissed him. Again, that, that's a a greeting of that time period. It's not a kiss on the mouth. It's, it's kind of a hug and a kiss on each side. You, you may have seen someone from French culture or, or other Mediterranean cultures do this. But Jesus said to him, and boy, this one hits me. Look, look at verse 50. Jesus doesn't say, betrayer, why have you come? He doesn't say, thief of the treasury. That was two weeks ago, right, when we looked at Judas. Why? He says, friend. I don't know exactly what Jesus had in that sentence, but Jesus was going to die for Judas on that cross also. He was willing to go and die, even though Judas was the one that turned him in. I wonder how many of us come to the king's table. Remember we talked last week, and we have betrayed Christ that week. We have not been engaged to him. Yet he still died so that we could come and, and remind us who we need to be. Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword. Remember, some of these disciples, 
thought Jesus was coming to set up what? A physical kingdom. And in a physical kingdom, a king needs swordsmen, right? He needs someone to fight the battles for him. Jesus was not setting up a physical kingdom. He was setting up a spiritual kingdom. And that's why some stopped following Jesus when they realized this. And suddenly, one of those who were with him, Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword. Struck. Let me read that again. I paused at the wrong place. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Wow. Right? I mean, in the scuffle, right? They're trying to arrest Jesus. His buddies are trying to help him out. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Jesus says, put the sword up. I don't need you to protect me. Remember, he, he's making peace with the Father on what's coming. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? He says, don't you think I could call on God right now hundreds of angels? Now remember, the angel of death had killed all the firstborn in Egypt. That's just one angel. What if he called legions of angels? Right? Well, what can they do? They're not just messengers in the Bible. They, they, they sometimes do things in the Bible. And there are several stories of, of God being able to send angelic beings to do things. How then could the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen to us? He says, if I did that, if you do what you do, then how can I go and be the cup of redemption? How can I go and be the Passover lamb? If this doesn't happen, it doesn't play out like God has willed, then the covenant doesn't happen. Boy, that's a change, isn't it? I don't know that he's any happier. I think he's still sad and heavy and distressed, and he's watching all this chaos around him. But he's been in communion with the Father. Right? He's been in prayer with the Father. He's preparing himself for this. In that hour, Jesus said to the multitude, so a lot of people have come out to arrest Jesus, right? These are not multitudes, though, that are there to see healing and prayer. Right? Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. A couple things there. The ear that got cut off, Jesus actually picks that ear up and puts it back on the head of the servant. He does a miracle right there in front of those that are ready to arrest him, and they still don't believe it. Right? None of them say, whoa. Right? But they just move on. Maybe some didn't see it because of the chaos. Uh, maybe they didn't want to admit it. And then Jesus says, you could have arrested me anywhere. Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? Why? Because there would have been a crowd of his multitude, right? There would have been a riot. And remember, I told you the Romans uh, in Fortress Antonio sits on the edge of the temple and could look down into the temple complex so the Jews began to plot or plan too much. The Roman soldiers could go in there and, and in AD 70 they're going to go in there and destroy the whole temple, right? Now, let's look at these last few verses here, or this last part of this last verse. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Yeah. What, what did they just say earlier? I told you to put them back in your mind. What? Oh, we're going to be with you, Jesus. We're going to be with you, Jesus. You know, on Sundays when you leave worship, when you've had communion, and you leave and you think, I am on fire for God. I, I, I'm going to do good for God this week. I, I'm going to tell people about Jesus, and I'm going to do things in Jesus' name. And then Monday morning, the alarm clock goes off, and you're irritable, and there's a long line at your local drive through to get your morning coffee. And then you get there and someone got your parking spot and, you know, somebody's late and, and something happened over the weekend to the computer system. And, you know, you, you, boy, you're not very Jesus, are you? You're not very Jesus. And, you know, that's real life. And these guys, these disciples are real people who hours before were let's go. And now all they do is go. <laughs> that's why I think communion is important on a weekly basis. That, that constant reminder. You know, maybe you need to be reminded. Maybe you have a reminder on your computer to do certain things at certain times of the day, right? Then all his disciples forsook him and fled. I wanted us to look at a map for a moment. I think sometime when we read these stories, and there are other places where you can read the story of the trials of Jesus, 
not the trial, right? Not the agony of the cup, but, but he's actually going to go before different groups and be put on trial. Because remember, what is their goal? To get him killed. Jews can't do that. They're not politically in charge, but they're going to have some political trials. They're going to have some religious trials. I thought we'd look back at this map. Now, you should recognize a few things already, right? He's left the upper room. He's crossed over the brook of Kidron. He's been out the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, now he's been arrested. So they're going to take him back across that brook and back into the city, right? And they're going to take him to Caiaphas's. And there they're going to have some trials and some things are going to happen and some things. And this is all being done at night. Remember, everybody else is eating and, and enjoying the Passover and being with family. But some of these men have left their families to come and take care of this matter, right? They've been plotting against him. Then Judas, yes, I'm in Matthew 27 now. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver. Wow, wow. Jesus had just called him friend. Imagine if we called more people friend. Imagine that a word could change someone's day, right? Saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. There's a lot in this passage. I'm not sure I can unpack it all here. Um, but Judas was at such a sorrowful place and such a heavy weight on him that he didn't have anybody to, to turn to. He didn't have the relationship with the Father. Remember, he had been stealing out of the treasury. He had been with Jesus the whole time, and yet he had not really tried to help Jesus or to become Jesus. And I don't mean to take his place, to be like him, to be more Christ-like. How many of us know Jesus? I mean, you could, you could win a contest of trivia or Jeopardy about Jesus, but, but are you becoming more like Jesus? So when Judas has his moment of trial, he fails. He doesn't have the support. But the chief priest took the pieces of silver, uh, the silver pieces, and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. They, they picked up the coins. Notice they, they got to do something with them. So they can't put them in the treasury because we kind of pay. They know what they, the coins were for, right? They know. And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, the field has been called the field of blood to this day. The money is taken and something else is done with it, right? Because it had been given to the temple to do good work with, but they had soiled it because of what it was used for. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was pierced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, excuse me, priced, Ten and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Jeremiah had said what? There's going to come a time where 30 pieces of silver are going to be put on the price of somebody and later that money is now dirty money and they're going to do something with it. This had been prophesied years before it happened, right? And what did Jesus? Jesus came to fulfill the prophets, right? right? He even said that's one of the reasons he's having to go through what he's going through. So we think of trials, we think of denials, right? Uh, we could look at Mark 14, we continue to read Matthew 27. I just wanted to remind you, he's been taken back to one house for trial. And remember, all this is at night. Then he gets marched all the way across town, right, to the Roman leaders, and, and they're going to do some things there. Remember, the Jews, they can't kill. They're, they're in occupation. And so there, they're going to do some things at the temple, and that's that Fortress Antonio there on the corner that I talked to you about. And so as they are making their way around, okay, now they've got to go back to Herod's palace. Herod is the, the Jewish leader. He's the Jewish king, kind of like a governor of a province. The Romans let him rule as long as he turns in the money and keeps the Jews from causing problems, and that had been one of the issues. Remember, what's, what's Jesus' title when he king of the Jews? That's what we've been talking about here, right? The Romans think he's some kind of rebel upstart. Well, they go to Herod, and Herod says, well, we can't have another king, right? I'm the king, so they're going to have a trial there. And then after all that is going on, right, then they've got to go back to the Romans and say, yeah, we, we found him guilty. He is guilty. They found him guilty of blasphemy, saying that he's the son of God, but that's not a, a, a civil charge. You know, I can't take you down to the local courthouse and say, well, you know, this person uh, in, fell asleep during church. Well, that, that's not a, a, a civil offense. That might be something we might 
you know, looked down on if that happened to you in church. Uh, again, not a sin or, or not something we're going to punish you for. But, but just uh, the courts would say that's not our business, right? Well, they've got to find something that makes it the Romans' business. And the idea is of blasphemy. It's that he says he's what king of the Jews. He, he's gonna he's trying to raise up a kingdom, and he is. But it's a spiritual kingdom. So that was kind of what Jesus being moved around the geography of the trials. So remember, he surrendered and surrendered. He is surrounded and surrendered uh, and arrested and led to the high priest. Um, he later will be struck and mocked and spit upon. And we're going to look at that in next week's lesson when we talked about the king's victory. That doesn't sound very victorious, does it? He's going to be led to a man named Pilate and Herod, then back to Pilate. He's going to again be mocked and scourged and have a crown of thorns. And again, he's going to fall under the weight of the cross. And we're, we're going to look at some of those things next week. And then he'll be crucified. So what is today's victory? Well, first of all, he resigned himself to the Father's will. Thy will be done. That's not how it necessarily started out, but that's how it ends. Because sometimes God has to put us through things that we understand it's his will, not our way. He doesn't want to please himself. The father answers his prayer. Uh, again, uh, he's heard because, he, again, he's got this weight. And, 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 and we see again in other passages where, he, boy, the language there is, is so intense. And he learned obedience through suffering. You never learn obedience. You ever done something the wrong way and had to redo it? You took a shortcut, and you learned it would have been better if you'd done it the way you were told the first time. Yeah, sometimes we learn through suffering. So, Jesus warns us, and I'm going to ask you: Have you been sleeping lately in your relationship with him? Or doing right doesn't always feel good at the moment. You know, sometimes you may do something. That is the correct thing. And people make fun of you and they laugh at you and people despise you. That's okay. Is it in the Father's will? And when temptation comes, the time to prepare is past. It's already here. Right? I mean, the temptations are right here. And so Jesus, because of his relationship with the Father, was able to get through this idea of, I don't think I want to be the cop. <laughs> But then he stops and he thinks about it and he realizes it's the only way. It's the only way for him to have a relationship with you and a relationship with me. Jesus went to his death willingly. We'll talk about that next week. And when we trust God and his way and we suffer in doing right, it leads to glory. Remember, this, this life is not what it's all about. This is a, this is a transition to something better, to, to a better victory. No one is serious about being a Christian can remain unmoved when they think of that agony in the garden. And maybe you've been in agony lately. Maybe you've had a heavy weight lately. Jesus knows what that's like. Talk to him about that so you can talk to the Father. And why does he drink the bitter cup? Because he loves us, right? There's a song. It was our sin, right, that took him there. So the trial there was Jesus deciding to be the sacrifice. We're going to talk about that sacrifice next week, and we're going to talk about that victory. I want to remind you, as I often do, wash your hands, wear a mask, watch your distance. But the most important thing in all this is clean your heart. Clean your heart and be ready for his coming. You guys have a blessed day.